Hello, my name is Luke Harding. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. The title of my talk is Technology, Values, Ethics and Consequences. From Innovation to Impact in Language Assessment. Back in June, I was invited to give a talk at this New Directions conference on the topic of technology and ethics. And since then, I've been thinking a lot about these issues, partly because I needed to plan a talk, but mostly because COVID-19 created a set of circumstances that accelerated a connection between digital technology and language assessment that was already in progress prior to the pandemic. I didn't have to go searching for issues where assessment and technology intersect. In some ways, it was more difficult to avoid them. And during the past six months, two different experiences have influenced my thinking on this topic. Observing the rapid shift of many language assessments to online mode, and reading about an assessment-related scandal in the UK over the calculation of A-level results through an algorithm. So on the first issue, as I'm sure everyone watching is aware, COVID-19 changed the landscape of language assessment through the rapid introduction of a range of take-at-home language tests designed to meet the needs of test takers and test users in making decisions, particularly for university admissions in countries where exams were suspended due to lockdowns and social distancing regulations. And Daniel Isbell and Benjamin Kreml reviewed a range of these tests in a recent article published in Language Testing, focusing on the tests listed here. And you can see the, the names on the screen. Some were new take-at-home versions of existing tests, and others were take-at-home options that preceded the pandemic and were, in effect, at the right place at the right time. And on mailing lists like Barleap, which is the British Association of Lecturers in English for Academic Purposes, there were extensive discussions of the pros and cons of various new options. And these discussions covered issues related to test construct, security concerns and consequences. So the focus was very much on risk minimization, the risk of using unknown or new assessments uh, balanced against competing risks around student recruitment and the subsequent financial impact on universities. So the situa situation raised some complex ethical issues for decision makers. The second issue was the A-level results scandal in the UK. Now in the UK, in the absence of final end of year secondary school exams, which had to be canceled because of lockdown restrictions, the exams regulator, OVQOL, instead used an algorithm to calculate students' final grades using data from prior assessments. So the problem was that the algorithm uh, ended up downgrading a very large proportion of students, almost 40% from their predicted grades. And those students who were downgraded typically came from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. The reasons for this were complex and a lack of transparency around the algorithm only made things worse. But the outcry was swift and it represented uh, the most intense scrutiny of assessment practices that I've seen in the British press since I've lived in the UK for 10 years. Some of the headlines are shown here. Now, following this intense media attention, as well as protests on the street by pupils and the threat of legal action, the algorithm was ditched and teacher assessments were used as the basis for grades instead. But at the heart of this discussion was an idea, or perhaps an ideology, about the fallibility of teacher judgments and the need to standardize and correct through technical solutions. But there was either a lack of oversight over the consequences of modeling, or the impact wasn't actually seen as problematic. But either of these situations is deeply concerning given the stakes at play. An interesting byproduct is that the framing of the story ultimately became focused on the algorithm itself, rather than its designers or those responsible for ensuring its fair application. 
The Prime Minister himself at one point referred to it as a mutant algorithm, an interesting discursive tactic to distance the government from what had become a politically damaging situation. So prior to the pandemic, technology was already playing an important role in assessment practices, affecting different aspects across the full development cycle from domain specification through to validation. And uh, there's a very nice summary of the influences of uh, technology and assessment in a chapter by Schmidgel and Powers cited here. The coronavirus pandemic only served to accelerate this process. Digital technology and language testing, I think it's fair to say, is here to stay. And our understanding of its function and potential is only going to become more important. But at the same time, we can see in the A-level results story an example of technical solutions in assessment that led to an outcome that lacked fairness and would have had negative, inequitable consequences if it hadn't been reversed. And this brings us to the issue of ethics, consequences, and social responsibility. We're starting to see much more focus on the consequences of technology in language assessment. So it's a sub-theme at this year's New Directions Conference, and it was the focus of a panel at last year's New Directions Conference in Yokohama. And this is a very welcome sign, because as Chappelle and Voss have stated, technology re-emphasizes the need for researchers to investigate the consequences of testing. The focus on consequences connects technological innovation with fundamental questions of professional ethics and social responsibility in our field. Now, a good person to turn to is James Moore, a moral philosopher at Dartmouth University, who has written extensively on the ethics of emerging technologies. And he proposed something called Moore's Law, uh, which says that as technological revolutions increase, their social impact, their ethical problems increase. And the idea behind this law, as Moore goes on to explain, is that this phenomenon happens not simply because an increasing number of people are affected by the technology, but because inevitably revolutionary technology will provide numerous novel opportunities for action, which well thought out ethical policies, uh, for which well thought out ethical policies will not have been developed. Now Moore maps out the stages of what he calls an open technological revolution across three stages, introduction, permeation, and power. So at the introduction stage, there are few people using the technology and the usefulness is relatively limited. At this introduction stage, the ethical consequences are considered relatively minor because there are very few people involved. But as technology starts to permeate and the technology is seen as more useful, more people start to use it and the ethical complications grow. So finally, at the power stage, technology is extremely common and at that stage, we see the potential for ethical complications at their peak, as the technology is firmly integrated into society and the social impact of the technology becomes significant. So applying Moore's ideas to our field, we can see that rapid technological advancement and a subsequent permeation and impact can pose new and unexpected ethical conundrums for those who design and use language assessments. And it can outstrip the field's ability to develop coherent ethical approaches to the problems that arise. So in this way, ethical concerns in technological innovation can amplify existing ethical concerns in our field around the consequences of test use. And returning to Chappelle and Voss's statement, it's clear that we need to look beyond the effectiveness or technical quality of technology in language testing, even though these topics are very important too. But we need to consider consequences within a broader ethical framework of social responsibility. As McNamara has described, this means looking at the key issues of washback, impact, and accountability. 
So I'm now going to turn to talk about three issues which provide useful insights into how technological innovation in language assessment might come into conflict with professional ethics and the social responsibilities of assessment professionals. First, the way in which technology in assessment delivery and scoring can constrain constructs of spoken language and the washback effects this might generate. Second, the way in which automated scoring of pronunciation in particular might reify the native speaker as the ideal language user, further reinforcing a language ideological position from which the field has been trying to escape. And third, the increasing salience of security and surveillance technology in online language assessment and the subsequent ethical issues that are raised. Let's look at the first issue, which is the constrained speaking constructs. So it's now fairly well understood that limitations of current technology may constrain what can be captured and measured in an assessment task. And this has potential negative effects in terms of construct underrepresentation and negative washback. But the trade off benefits of such sy systems are also uh, well understood greater reliability or consistency, um, high practicality, and rapid score reports and feedback to test takers. Now we can visualize this tension on a continuum. Thinking in terms of task constraints, we can imagine that at the less constrained end, we have speaking tests that are administered by humans and scored by humans. So these tests allow for interaction among candidates and the examiner through tasks like interviews, conversation, and pair or group discussion. And the resulting discourse will be uh, more interactive, possibly more unpredictable, and less constrained by the demands of the medium. Now, these types of tasks uh, may still be delivered over a computer system, such as through video conferencing, uh, as described in recent research by Nakatsuhara and colleagues. But the key is that there is interaction with a human interlocutor and human scoring. Now in the middle, we have those tests that are computer administered and human scored. Uh, so a more classic sort of semi-direct test where there are typically pre-recorded prompts and candidates provide a, a monologic response to these prompts. So the task can still elicit extemporaneous speech, uh, though interaction is much more constrained. And this is scored against rating criteria by human scorers. Then at the more constrained end, we have those uh, speaking tests which are computer administered and computer scored. And these are what Talia Isaacs has called fully automated uh, speaking assessments. And these typically have a much more constrained range of tasks, such as reading aloud or uh, sentence repetition, short picture descriptions, and other uh, more extended responses on topics where the language elicited might be fairly predictable. And this is to enable the automated scoring system to work effectively. Now, if we change the labels on the continuum, we can see that it works equally well in the other direction when we're focusing on reliability and consistency. But more reliability and consistency requires more uniformity. So the question then becomes, what aspects of the speaking construct get lost in this trade-off? And what effects might this have on teaching and learning? Now, as test providers have been exploring methods of online delivery, um, tasks built on psycholinguistic principles and automated AI scoring, it seems as if research into language constructs, particularly constructs of spoken language, have been moving in the other direction. So in recent years, we've been developing sophisticated understandings of complex constructs of, of language performance in areas like pragmatic competence and interactional competence. Um, and the area where I've done some research um, looking at lingua franca competence, so focusing on 
contexts where speakers from diverse L1 and L2 uh, lingua cultural backgrounds need to communicate with each other, adapting and accommodating to a, a range of different varieties. Now, this kind of competence requires a focus on the linguistic repertoires and communicative strategies required to function in a fluid and dynamic uh, language use environment. And one of the most important aspects of lingua franca competence is seen to be pragmatics. And Kanagaraja sums this up well in his 2006 paper, where he says, such realizations suggest the need for an important shift in assessment practices, from focusing overly on proficiency in grammar or in abstract linguistic features, um, we have to focus more on proficiency in pragmatics. Sociolinguistic skills of dialect differentiation, code switching, style shifting, uh, interpersonal communication, conversation management and discourse strategies are important for shuttling between uh, English varieties. Now, we have seen some movements in this direction in more semi-direct tests of speaking. So Plow et al. discussed the way in which uh, this pragmatic competence is being assessed in tests such as Pearson Professional. Um, so this kind of discourse completion test style task where an examinee is presented with a prompt which says something like, you borrowed a jacket from your friend, uh, and accidentally spilled coffee on it. The coffee left a big stain. Mark wants his jacket back. Uh, what would you say to him? So this kind of task is soliciting an apology. And these tasks are a step in the right direction. But without an interlocutor, they still can't capture key elements of interaction, such as comprehension checks, uh, co-construction of meaning, and other important elements of communicative behavior, such as hesitation devices, which can function as hedges um, in the delivery of, of face-threatening speech acts. And this problem has been recognized and it's actually being actively investigated in ongoing work being conducted by Philip Horn, a PhD student at Lancaster University. But a further complication is that speech acts that typically take place over multiple turns in conversation are difficult to capture without the presence of an interlocutor. Now let's take a look at some data showing a multi-turn speech act in action. Here is uh, some data showing a disagreement. And this data is uh, drawn from a 45 minute group discussion um, designed to simulate a typical university class discussion involving six speakers from different lingua cultural backgrounds communicating in English. Now in this part that you see here, uh, the interactants were discussing whether the UK is a polite country. So I know it's a bit of a controversial topic, but um, this is where their conversation took them. And the red arrow here points to a claim made by speaker H that compared to South Korea and Japan, uh, the UK doesn't have what she calls a service mind in service transactions. Now speaker J eventually disagrees with this statement or gives a qualified disagreement in the area indicated with green, but it takes him a while to get there. Um, first, he laughs in response to H, and then a few turns later, he attempts to gain the floor by saying, um, he then laughs again. Um, and it's worth noting that one of the key features of lingua franca communication is to keep talk consensus oriented, uh, particularly before delivering a, a face threatening act like disagreement. And we see back channeling uh, then in line 31. And it's not until line 33 uh, where speaker J says, well, uh, signaling that he wants to take the floor. Um, and then he begins his disagreement sequence. But even here, he doesn't disagree straight away. Um, he doesn't say, I'm afraid I disagree, as many course books might suggest he should. Um, let's actually zoom in on that section to see um, exactly what happens. So as you can see here, instead he actually engages in what disagreement research would say is a standard strategy. 
um, he delays the disagreement through an extended yes but structure. So in lines 35 to 37, um, he agrees with Speaker H, referring to some, a statement that she made many turns previously. But then in lines 39 to 40, he proposes his opposing stance through a focus shift, comparing the UK favorably to other countries. It's also notable, I think, that Speaker Jay's turns are carefully delivered with a repertoire of mitigating devices. So the most obvious is several long hesitations, and uh, you can see the hesitations here indicated with the numbers in, in brackets to indicate seconds. Um, but also there are some overt instances of sound lengthening, so and and is. These all combine to help Speaker Jay attenuate the impact uh, of the face-threatening oppositional stance. But it's likely that these micro features would not be scored favorably if this response on its own were to be run through an automated scoring engine for speech. Now, as I said earlier, arguments for uh, less direct speaking assessment tend to rest on claims around prediction, uh, psycholinguistic validity, and the benefits for reliability and consistency. These arguments are understandable, and uh, in many cases, they're well supported. But there's no getting around the fact that current technology doesn't allow for direct assessment of these more complex constructs of language without the presence of a human interlocutor and a human rater. And we're seeing at the moment rapid uptake of more efficient uh, computer administered exam formats for reasons of convenience and cost. But this rapid uptake and permeation uh, into educational systems suggests that washback effects may now be significant. Perhaps the ethical issue here is that we just don't really know the effects in real time uh, of these exam formats on teaching or, or learning. And there have actually been few studies focusing specifically on washback of these kinds of fully automated speaking assessments. But the evidence that does exist suggests some worrying trends. So an article uh, very recently published in Language Testing by Knock et al. Uh, looked at test preparation practices among students studying to take the PTE academic. Now, most participants in the study were taking the test to demonstrate language proficiency for immigration requirements. So it was a very high stakes context. And the researchers found uh, two preparation methods associated with examinees who improved their speaking score over multiple occasions. Uh, deliberate practice of pronunciation and fluency and attempts to understand uh, what affects machine scoring. Now this I think was a fascinating finding. Uh, the researchers go on to explain that coaches advised candidates to, uh, and this is from the article, to reduce pausing in speech, to speak faster, more clearly and loudly, and to avoid hesitations and fillers such as ums and ahs. So precisely the opposite of what we saw Speaker Jay doing earlier in, in a more interactive environment. And test takers also practiced with digital tools uh, to help them monitor and avoid periods of silence. So using the, the sound recorders, for example, on their mobile phones. Now this, in my view, um, is a, a different kind of washback. It's more akin to what is sometimes called system gaming in the wider literature on algorithms. But while some framings of this sort, uh, this sort of practice may see it as a, a kind of unethical form of test preparation, in this case, it was in fact born out of a, a lack of transparency about the nature of the algorithm itself. And a different framing is that these test takers were developing a critical algorithmic literacy and applying it in a situation where they effectively had very little power. But the findings here align with findings from research on automated writing evaluation as well, uh, which have shown that even in low stake situations, 
students using an automated scoring or feedback system may orient towards features which they know will give them a high score. Uh, and they'll try to work with the system to crack the algorithm. So it's clear that we need a much better understanding uh, of the unique nature of washback in automated scoring settings uh, to better understand how learners prepare to interact with machine-based algorithmic scoring. Now the next issue is native speaker ideologies in automated pronunciation assessment. So pronunciation assessment generally is fraught with ethical challenges. And one of these is determining the right construct to operationalize. So there's now a well-known distinction made in the research literature between the nativeness principle, so this notion that learners should aim for a native-like pronunciation in their L2, and the intelligibility principle, so the idea that the key concern for L2 learners is to be understood. And these are not the same thing. As Munro and Dering have shown, L2 speakers can be highly intelligible and comprehensible, even when an L2 accent is very noticeable. And similarly, native speaker pronunciation is no guarantee of intelligibility across a wide range of lingua franca contexts. So many researchers have been actively trying to move away from the nativeness principle, um, which is now seen as an outdated concept. And the focus instead is on trying to identify features which contribute more or less to intelligibility. And this is in keeping with a view of language that values diversity and seeks to understand the nature of effective communication within this diversity. So viewing variation as a, a natural uh, and indeed a fundamental characteristic of language. Language assessment has followed this lead to some extent. I know that Talia Isaacs, who I've worked with on some of these issues, uh, talked to this conference last year and showed evidence that the field is taking steps towards an intelligibility-based approach in rating scales. But the problem is that there is potential for some approaches to, to automated pronunciation assessment to send us back to a nativeness orientation. This is a problem that several researchers have recognized, including uh, Cheryl Cook in a very interesting recent paper. Now, the reason for this concern is that automated scoring systems will be computationally easier when the target model is more uniform. So as Van Moore and Suzuki explain, from a software modeling point of view, the option of having just one variety of English as the reference would be the easiest computational way to discriminate very accurately among learners who have that pronunciation and those who do not. But as more accents and pronunciations are included in the reference model, it becomes more ambiguous and poorer at discriminating among learners. So this means that decisions made early in the design stages of any automated scoring system around selecting the characteristics of the reference corpus, um, in determining how inclusive it will be of different L2 varieties. All this has a great deal of influence later on. And these decisions will reflect and embed the values of the test designer in the scoring system. Now, this potential problem has been recognized in uh, recent contributions on automated pronunciation assessment. And organizations like ETS appear to be aware of the need to ensure that automated pronunciation assessments do target an intelligibility construct. But there's been an explosion of automated pronunciation uh, pronunciation assessment systems onto the market, particularly in the area of computer assisted pronunciation training or CAPT. And we're actually seeing a strong shift back to a nativeness principle in many of these products. For example, uh, Carnegie Speech Assessment has a product called Native Accent which uses a speech evaluation system trained on uh, providing spectral matches to a corpus of native American English speech. And you can see a, 
a description of that system on the slide here. Um, in some research presented just a couple of weeks ago at the IA TEFL Pronunciation Special Interest Group, group Conference, uh, Valashak reported on a work in progress exploring the models used in free CAPT apps that are available through Google Play. And the researchers identified 296 apps. So there's a lot of them out there. Um, and they found that uh, prestige native speaker varieties uh, provided the dominant models. And even in situations where intelligibility is explicitly described as the target, it can be described in narrow terms. So take, for example, this description of Phonologic's uh, automated pronunciation screening test, where intelligibility is defined in terms of what is understood by American English listeners only. And in the sphere of uh, proficiency testing, there are numerous companies now offering off-the-shelf automated scoring solutions. But it's usually difficult uh, to find information about the scoring systems because details of the algorithm remain proprietary knowledge. So this is the so-called black box problem. And in some ways, this is equally problematic because in the absence of transparency about a scoring system, test takers are likely to take a more risk averse approach. And a lack of transparency may lead to a perceived construct of native-like speech among test takers, which would just sustain an ideological hegemony. The issue is not simply one of potential negative washback here. Um, we know that tests and assessments have power, and the ideological position of the native speaker in assessment has impacts beyond the test. Native speaker ideologies reverberate in uh, current discussions around accentism, which is accent-based discrimination. Um, and native uh, speaker ideologies also drive the highly controversial accent reduction industry. And they connect with current critiques of hiring policies for language teachers. So it's important that in language assessment, we think very carefully uh, about the values embedded in constructs, particularly with automated scoring systems where values are baked in to the algorithm. We need to continue to prioritize values in our constructs that recognize diversity and inclusiveness, particularly in the sensitive area of pronunciation where assessment connects so closely with identity issues. Now, the final issue I want to talk about is the increased use of security and surveillance technology in language assessment. Now, the connection between technology and language test security has been growing in recent years. But this year saw a flashpoint as a range of take-at-home tests came onto the market. Now, Isbell and Kreml uh, surveyed a range of those tests, as I mentioned earlier, and identified various security measures which were adopted in each case. You can see in this table um, the details of security measures taken in four selected tests. Um, Duolingo uses remote video proctoring, um, including AI monitoring and selective human reviewing of video recordings. IELTS Indicator uses a secure exam browser which disables uh, other applications during the test. Um, TOEFL IBT uses the ProctorU Live Plus service which does uh, synchronous video-based human proctoring um, with technology used to monitor activity and settings uh, on the examinee's computer. And Versant uses the Hire Pro remote proctoring service, which monitors device activity and records human activity via camera. And then AI is used to flag suspicious behavior for later uh, human review. Now, remote proctoring is fairly new technology in our field. And so to my knowledge, um, there hasn't been a lot of published research on it in language testing specifically but there has been quite a lot of commentary uh, on remote proctoring in the wider media over the past six months. 
And there are three main critiques that emerge from this uh, commentary. The first is that there are strong elements of surveillance in the technology. And some examinees, and in fact, some human, uh, remote human proctors themselves, um, have reported a sense of creepiness in the setup where an examinee is observed by a, a remote individual online. And there are potential inequalities that may not be taken into account with this kind of technology. So, for example, people who are, are not able, for whatever reason, to sit in the same position for a long period of time or people with caring responsibilities who can't control who's coming in and out of the room. And then there are issues around data storage and access. And this is very sensitive data that's being collected, camera scans of people's rooms and so on. And the data security issues need to be taken very seriously. But beyond remote proctoring, there are broader issues around security technologies in language assessment um, at the moment. Cheating and fraud are typically viewed as threats to validity um, of test scoring interpretations. They're seen as sources of construct irrelevant variance in the test scores. So in effect, when cheating or fraud is detected, um, this detection short circuits the score interpretation and the score is rendered null or void while an investigation takes place. But technologies used for cheating and fraud detection must themselves demonstrate reliability and validity if this process is to be ethical. And this raises a really important question. Should ancillary technologies such as cheating and fraud detection systems in language assessment be considered within the same frame as validation arguments for the tests themselves? Currently, we can ask who is responsible for monitoring or evaluating the validity of security technologies. And if such technologies uh, should be considered within the frame of validity, then we should also consider their consequences. We can ask questions like, what consideration is there of the consequences of misuse or misclassification? Are appeals processes transparent and accessible? How do language testers navigate situations where security technology is used in the service of politically motivated policy aims? And this is something that my colleagues and I explored in a, a recent article. And all of this suggests that ethical guidelines for good practice around security and technology are probably in need of urgent updating given how swiftly uh, this aspect of language assessment is, is evolving. So in conclusion, I want to propose some solutions or at least um, some steps that could be taken towards dealing with some of the issues I've raised in this talk. And they relate to research, to transparency and to multidisciplinary innovation. So on research, it would be very important to uh, refocus research energies around technology and language assessment onto washback and social impact. So to determine the effects on pedagogy and on society in real time. These changes are happening very rapidly uh, and yet we, we don't have a great deal of evidence to understand the impact of these changes. So in terms of washback, this would involve projects like uh, exploring learners' engagement uh, with uh, and attitudes towards interactional competence or lingua franca competence in contexts where they're preparing for a computer-delivered and computer-scored exam. And it might also mean exploring system gaming uh, approaches or the development of critical algorithmic literacy um, in test preparation contexts. But this might ultimately lead to new theories or new understandings of washback itself. And in terms of social impact, it would mean investigating stakeholder perceptions of the values embedded in automated scoring models. And also, I think really importantly, broadening impact to understand the nature of language ideologies which flow out from test constructs. 
So exploring language ideologies within educational ecosystems and connections with automated tools or assessments that use native speakers as a reference model. The next area is transparency. And the field must insist, I think, on greater transparency around algorithms and also around scoring models and security technology. So this would involve principles such as accountable decision making, but also making an effort to increase public understanding around algorithms. So explaining their functions in accessible language for test users and other stakeholders. It would also include investigating and reporting on the potential for discrimination and harm to test takers. At the very least, there should be appeals or complaints procedures that involve human judges. And as I said earlier, these should be quick and accessible. Ideally, these expectations around transparency should be encoded into codes of ethics and guidelines for good practice that are produced by different organizations and associations within our field. These are big issues, but it's likely that developers will need to be proactive because legal challenges, uh, like the legal challenge that was threatened around the A-level algorithm scandal in the UK, may become more common in the future. And finally, multidisciplinary innovation. So in 2018, I gave a talk uh, on a very similar topic at the ECOLT conference, but the focus in that talk was on assessment literacy or understanding a new kind of assessment literacy. But in that talk, I tried to imagine a sort of shared space that would act as a meeting point between language assessment professionals on one hand and technology professionals on the other. The idea was that there should be cross fertilization of ideas and as much collaboration as possible between these different groups working on different aspects of technology in language assessment. Now recently I've been working with Benjamin Kreml and we've been developing ideas on this topic and in a recent presentation at the Baal TSIG conference, Benjamin expanded very usefully on that original idea and he added a few more groups to the mix, um, SLA researchers, pedagogy experts, teachers, um, and also, very importantly, test users themselves. So taking account of their needs as well. But given what I've been talking about today, um, I want to add another group to the mix, and that is sociolinguists because I think one of the biggest issues that has come up in today's talk is the tendency towards uniformity in language that technology can introduce. And this is not necessarily a healthy development. So we need sociolinguists involved very heavily uh, in developing automated scoring technology, uh, in discussing and researching impact and, and so on. And I also think it's probably worthwhile moving test users right into the middle of this collaborative space. Responsible innovation in the future will involve all of these groups working together and sharing a diversity of views to innovate in ways that lead to positive impact. So thank you. I'm going to stop my talk there, um, but I would like to acknowledge um, these people who you can see on the slide here who um, have helped me a lot in talking through a lot of these ideas um, over the past few months um, and of course um, may not agree with everything that was in this talk anyway um, but I will also show my references as well for those who are interested. Thank you very much.